Welcome to Coffee and Books channel. In this video we will present the summary of, and then there were none, by Agatha Christie. The novel begins on a train on its way to the seaside town of Sticklehaven, England. Over the course of the first chapter we're introduced to all eight characters headed to a place called Indian Island for their own different reasons. Each character received a letter in the mail requesting their presence on the island. The characters are Justice Wargrave, a recently retired judge who was sent a letter from an old friend named Constance Culmington inviting him to spend some time on the island over a vacation, Vera Claythorne, a woman who was hired as a secretary by the wife of the island's owner a man named Owen. Vera was reluctant to take the job and go to the island as she had just gone through the recent drowning death of someone close to her. We are told that she was present at the time of this person's death and has been cleared of all charges of her involvement, but we're not told who the person who died is. Philip Lombard, a man who was also told he was hired for a job on Indian Island, but we're not told what that job is only that he is being paid well for it, it is implied that Lombard may deal in a legal business of some type. Emily Brandt, a strictly conservative, very religious woman who is traveling to Indian Island for a holiday. She recently received a letter from an unknown source who would only reveal that they once shared a guest house with her. The signature on the letter, however is illegible. Regardless of that fact, Emily Brandt decided to take the holiday. General MacArthur, we're told is taking a different, slower train due to some complications with his ticket. He was invited to the island by some old friends who wanted to see him. The general is glad for the invitation as he worries that because of an old rumor about him, his friends now tend to avoid him, we're not told what the rumor is. Dr. Armstrong, is taking a different means of transportation to Sticklehaven, namely driving. He has been asked to travel to the island to report on the condition of Mrs. Owen, the island owner's wife. While driving he reflects on an accident that happened some years earlier while he was still drinking heavily, that almost crippled his career. Suddenly he was passed by a man called Tony Marston driving dangerously fast. On a completely different train from the first two, the last introduction in the chapter, Mr. Bloor is skimming over the list of every character that has been introduced so far, he is aware that they are all headed to Indian Island and he is headed there himself for a job that we are not told the specifics of, he says that this job will be easy. The only other person on the train with him, an older man, tells him that a storm is rolling in over the island and that the Day of Judgment is near. Bloor only thinks that the old man is closer to judgment than him. At the start of Chapter 2, all of the characters on the trains have made it to the Sticklehaven train station and await taxis to take them to the dock. Each of the guests are surprised but not necessarily unnerved to learn that they are all going to the same place, Indian Island, and that none of them have met before. Soon, a man named Fred Narricott shows up to take the group to the island on his boat. He inwardly wonders why Mr. Owen, the billionaire he knows to own the island, would invite such an odd group of people to his house, none of whom seem to know each other. When they reach the island, Fred Narricott leaves and the guests are greeted at the door of a large mansion by the butler, Mr. Rogers. The Rogers tell the group that their host has been delayed but that their rooms have been prepared and they should feel free to make themselves comfortable. Each member of the group goes to their own room to prepare for the evening. Vera notices a needlepoint on the wall of her room which spells out a nursery rhyme that she remembers from her childhood called Ten Little Indians, in the rhyme. Ten little Indian children are killed one by one in accidents while doing work. In the end of the rhyme only one Indian boy is left, he hangs himself and the rhyme ends with the sentence and then there were none. Later in the evening, Dr. Armstrong arrives and immediately recognizes Justice Wargrave as he passes him in the hall, he recalls having given medical testimony in Wargrave's courtroom several times. Wargrave asks Armstrong about Constance Calmington and is confused when the doctor tells him that he never heard of the woman. At the end of the chapter, the guests are all preparing themselves for dinner, and MacArthur says that he regrets coming and wishes he could leave, but he realizes that's impossible because the Fred Narricott's boat has already left the island and won't be returning for a few days. The guests are soon called down to dinner and notice a set of ten china figures of Indians set up in the center of the dining room table. Vera points out that they match the rhyme hanging on the wall in her room. After dinner, the group moves to the drawing room to relax and have a drink. All are chatting amongst themselves when suddenly a disembodied, recorded voice starts speaking over the chatter of the room. No one can tell from where the voice is coming, but it names every guest in the room individually, even Mr. and Mrs. Rogers, and accuses them of a murder that happened at some point in their past. The voice gives specific details about each murder in an emotionless mechanical tone. After naming every suspect and their victim, the voice stops just as mysteriously as it began. The room erupts into a wave of denial. 
with each guest protecting their innocence and launching into anger at being accused, they begin to search for the source of the voice, and Philip Lombard soon finds the source of the voice. An old-fashioned record player in the next room. Rogers, the butler, admits that he was told to turn it on at a certain time in the instructions for the night from his employer, but that he had no idea what it would play, written on the record are the words swan song. Everyone gathers once again in the drawing room and asks Mr. Rogers to confess to them that neither her, nor his wife have actually met their employer, the supposed Mr. Owen, they, Mr. and Mrs. Rogers, say that they were hired by an agency and they received their instructions by mail. Taking charge of the situation, Justice Wargrave asks everyone to explain the circumstances that brought them to the island. Everyone, of course, explains an invitation that promised something different, and the group realize that whoever Mr. Rowan is, he has impersonated various friends and old acquaintances in their life to get them there together. Wargrave notes that the recording mentioned a Mr. Bloor, but that there is no one with that name in their group. At this point, Mr. Bloor admits that the name he gave them, Mr. Davis, was fake and that he is a private detective hired to investigate by Mr. Owen. Wargrave points out that Owen is probably a made-up name, and that they might just have been brought together by a homicidal maniac, every member of the group is ready to defend themselves against the accusation laid on them. Wargrave, who is a judge and who is accused of killing a man named Edward Seaton during a trial, says that Seaton was only an accused murderer on whom he passed a sentence, Vera was accused of killing a boy named Cyril Hamilton but states that she was only his governess, he drowned while swimming in the ocean and she tried her best to save him but failed. General MacArthur was accused of killing his wife's lover, Arthur Richmond, but insists that Richmond was one of his officers who died on a military mission, he denies that his wife ever had an affair. Philip Lombard says that the murder he was accused of, the killing of 21 members of an African tribe by leaving them stranded was not true. He then confesses that he did take their food and had abandoned them in the wilderness, but only to save himself. Mr. Bloor was accused of killing a man named James Landor, he says that Landor was a man that he testified against when he was a police officer, but that Landor only died later in jail. Dr. Armstrong denies even knowing the woman that he was accused of murdering, a patient named Louisa Mary, that he was accused of killing by mistake while he was performing on her a surgery while drunk, privately though, he admits that he does remember the case. Tony Marston is the only one in the group that admits that he is guilty of the charge. He confesses that he ran over his victims while driving recklessly, two children named John and Lucy Coombs. Mr. and Mrs. Rogers were charged with the death of Jennifer Brady, an old sick woman who used to be their employer, they admit that they did inherit some money after her death, but that they had no hand in it. Emily Brent refuses to even speak to the accusation against her. After going through the accusations individually, Wargrave suggests that the group should cease participating in this little stunt and leave in the morning as soon as the boat comes back. All of the guests agree except Tony Marston who suggests that they stay and solve the mystery of the man so-called Owen's true identity, while speaking he takes a drink, then suddenly chokes on it and dies immediately. The other guests are horrified, but since Marston poured the drink himself, they can only assume that he willfully committed suicide by poisoning himself. Marston's body is carried to his bedroom and covered with a sheet. As it is getting late, it's decided that everyone should go to bed and lock their doors, as no one trusts the other and Mr. Owen can be anyone at this point. The party assumes that they will be able to leave in the morning once Fred Narricott is contacted. Only Mr. Rogers stayed awake to clean up after the dinner, he notices that one of the ten Indian plates on the table is missing. Alone in each of their bedrooms, the group can only listen to the sound of the sea crashing against the rocks outside, and think about the truth of the accusations leveled against them. Vera in particular remembers the day little Cyril died and how she knew before his death that if he dies her lover Hugo would be able to inherit their family's fortune. Before going to bed she notices the similarity between the first verse of the Ten Little Indians poem and Philip Marston's death, the first verse reads, one chalked his little self and then they were nine. In the middle of the night, Mr. Rogers wakes Dr. Armstrong from a nightmare, Mr. Rogers tells the doctor that he is concerned because he realized after finishing cleaning and retiring to his bed that he could not wake his wife from her sleep. Dr. Armstrong examines Mrs. Rogers and finds that she has died in her sleep from an overdose of some kind. In the morning, the guests rise and go out to the dock before breakfast, hoping to see the boat coming back to the island, however, when it does not appear on time they start to worry. After breakfast, Dr. Armstrong tells the group of Mrs. Rogers' death. Vera can't help but notice that her death resembles the second verse in the Ten Little Indians poem, which reads, Nine little Indian boys sat up very late, one overslept himself and then there were eight. 
Mr. Rogers is horrified to notice that there are now only eight Indian plates in the center of the table, as if after every death a plate was gone. Later in the day, Emily Brent and Vera Claythorne take a walk together on the cliffs surrounding the estate. Emily tells Vera that she assumes that Mrs. Rogers killed herself from a guilty conscience, she also clarifies the story of her own accusation. Emily was accused of killing a woman named Beatrice Taylor, a young maid who worked for her years before. She told her that the girl got pregnant after which Emily immediately threw her out of the house, depressed, Beatrice killed herself shortly after, Emily insists that she does not feel remorse for this as Beatrice killed herself by her own decision. Nearby, Lombard and Dr. Armstrong discuss the murders and decide that they don't believe that Mrs. Rogers killed herself. Since the likelihood of two suicides happening within a 12-hour period in the same house is very low. Armstrong tells Lombard and Blore about the Indian figures disappearing, and they both notice how the two murders that have happened so far match up with the first two verses of the Indian boy's rhyme. They decide that whoever the so-called Owen is, he must be hiding somewhere on the island and committing these murders. They decide to search the island immediately, because the island is mostly bare rock, the search doesn't take them long and they come up empty-handed. Lombard however, reveals that he has a revolver in his coat and this surprise is Mr. Bloor. The men come to some cliffs and realizes that they will need a rope to get to the bottom so that they can search the caves within. Bloor volunteers to return to the house to get one. Meanwhile, Vera alone now, come across General MacArthur sitting by himself and staring off into the sea. The old man is clearly dazed and delusional, he insists that the end is coming and that they have very little time. He is calm however, and wants to be left alone. He tells Vera that he is happy to be dying soon and that he has felt guilt over the death of his alleged victim Arthur Richmond for some time. Blore returns with a rope and he and Armstrong lower Lombard to the bottom of the cliffs to make a search of the caves, Blore finds Lombard to be a suspiciously good climber and that he thinks it's odd that he would have a revolver. After searching, Lombard announces that he found nothing and the three men return to the house to search it as well. The search ends quickly, as the house is modern and has few places to hide, at the end. The three men are forced to conclude that there is no one on the island beside the eight remaining members of the group. Afterwards, the men started an argument. Bloor demands to know why Lombard has a revolver. Lombard insists that he was hired to do a job by a man named Isaac Morris and Morris told him that he might run into trouble of some type on the island, just then the bell rings to announce that lunch is ready. All of the guests gather in the dining table except General MacArthur who Armstrong goes to fetch. Soon after leaving, Armstrong bursts back into the room. Before he can speak, Vera guesses that MacArthur is dead, Armstrong confirms that, saying that MacArthur was killed by a blow to the head, Vera notices that only seven Indian plates now remain on the table. MacArthur's body is retrieved by Bloor and Armstrong and placed in his room, everyone gathers in the drawing room once again and Wargrave tells them that he has concluded that the murderer must be someone in the group, everyone in the group except Vera, agrees with this conclusion. He then asks if any one of them can be cleared of suspicion and after some objections on behalf of the women and some of the men, it's agreed that the group should proceed as if any one of them could be the murderer, it was decided that no one in the group has a solid alibi that will clear them of the murders committed, Wargrave then warns them all to be careful of who they trust, Wargrave dismisses them and the group split up to talk about their suspicions. Vera and Lombard talk in the living room, agreeing that they do not suspect each other, Lombard admits that he thinks Wargrave is the killer and Vera says it is Armstrong, since he is the only doctor present and could make up anything he wanted about the manner of death of the victims. Nearby, Wargrave and Armstrong talk as well, Armstrong worries that they will be murdered in their beds that night, Wargrave says that while he has no evidence that would stand in the court of law, he believes he knows who the killer is. That afternoon, the group gathers for tea time in the drawing room, Mr. Rogers rushes in to announce that one of the silk curtains in the bathroom has gone missing. None of the group knows what this means but it reignites their nerves. The group eats dinner and retires to bed, locking their doors. Before Mr. Rogers goes to bed he locks the dining room door so that no one can remove any more of the Indian plates. Many of the guests sleep in the next morning and are confused as to why Mr. Rogers didn't come to wake them. They look for Rogers but are unable to find him, Vera notices in the open dining room that another Indian plate is missing. Soon the group finds Mr. Rogers' body in the woodshed with a hatchet wound in the back of his neck. Upon seeing this, Vera points out to the fourth verse of the rhyme, seven little Indian boys chopping up sticks, one chopped himself in halves and then there were six. Slightly hysterical, she remembers that the next verse was about bees and wonders if there are any hives on the island, she comes to her senses only after Armstrong slaps her. Emily and Vera decide to prepare a breakfast themselves. While they cook, Bloor tells Lombard that he thinks that Emily is the killer, 
He also admits that he did have more to do with the crime he was accused of by the recording than he'd let on earlier. After breakfast is over, Wargrave suggests that the group gathers in the drawing room again. Emily says that she feels dizzy and wishes to stay at the table. After the others leave, after the others leave, Emily sees a bee buzzing on the window and realizes that there is someone standing behind her. Her thoughts are sluggish and obviously drugged. She assumes that the person behind her is Beatrice Taylor, the maid that dies on her watch, and feels a tick on her neck. After discussing the likelihood of Emily being the killer, the others return to the dining room to find her dead of an injection from a hypodermic needle. Armstrong admits that he has a needle in his bag due to his profession as a doctor, and the remaining guests go to his room and find that the needle is gone. After this, Wargrave gets the idea to lock away anything that could potentially be used as a weapon, especially Lombard's gun and Armstrong's medical bag. It is then discovered that Lombard's gun is also missing. They store Armstrong's medical bag in a case that requires a key and put that in another chest that requires a different key. One key is given to Lombard and the other one to Bloor. This way, the two equally young and strong men would have to fight one another to obtain the other key and neither could break into the case or the chest without making noise and alarming the others. Everyone goes to the drawing room, where they must light candles to light up the house as Mr. Rogers was the only one capable of operating the house's generator. As only five people are left, they all agree that only one person will ever go anywhere at a time, while the remaining four all stay together to prevent anyone from getting murdered. Vera goes by herself to take a shower in her room, when she enters the room she smells salt and sea and feels something wet and clammy touch her throat. She screams and the others come running only to find that a piece of seaweed is hanging from the ceiling, Lombard guesses that it was meant to remind her of Cyril's drowning and frighten her. Bloor fetches Vera a glass of alcohol but she refuses to drink it in fear that he might poison her, this initiates an argument that only stops when they realize that Wargrave failed to come upstairs with them. Downstairs, they find him sitting in his chair with a red silk curtain that was missing draped across his chest and a grey judge's wig made from some wool that Emily had lost earlier. Wargrave apparently have been shot in the head, and the group remembers the fifth verse from the rhyme, five little Indian boys going in for law, one got in chancery, dressed like a judge, and then there were four. After Wargrave's death, his body is moved to his room and the remaining four members of the party eat dinner quickly and then go to bed. Each person believes that they know the identity of the killer but none of them make an accusation aloud, Lombard notices that his gun is now back in the drawer in his room. Vera lies awake remembering Cyril's drowning and admits to herself that she encouraged him that he could make a swim out to a nearby rock knowing that he would fail and drown, she wonder if her lover Hugo knows what she did. In his room, Bloor tries to go over everything that has happened since he arrived at the island, but finds it hard to concentrate and keeps thinking back to his framing of his alleged victim, James Landor. He hears a noise in the hall outside of his room and slips out to investigate. A figure darts through the shadows going out the front door of the house. Bloor wakes Lombard and Vera and they find that Dr. Armstrong is not in his room. Instructing Vera to stay put in her room, the two men hurry outside to see if they can find Armstrong, assuming now that he is the killer. Soon they return admitting that they were unable to find anyone. The three remaining guests find a broken window pane downstairs and only three Indian plates in the dining room. The storm that prevented the mainland from being contacted is passed and they consider different ways to try leaving the island. Vera reminds the men of the next verse in the rhyme that corresponds with Armstrong's disappearance, four little Indian boys going out to sea, a red herring swallowed one and then there were three. She then assumes that perhaps Dr. Armstrong isn't really dead at all and that he vanished only in an effort to distract them as he was the alleged killer. The trio spend their morning on the cliffs unsuccessfully attempting to signal the mainland using a mirror to reflect sunlight. After a few hours, Bloor decides to go back into the house to get something to eat. Afraid to go alone, he asks Lombard for the gun but Lombard refuses. Once Bloor leaves, Lombard tells Vera that he thinks Bloor is the killer. Vera insists that Armstrong may still be alive but also suggests that the killer could maybe be a supernatural entity, perhaps a spirit or an alien. Lombard suspects that Vera may have a mental breakdown over her guilt and asks her for the truth about what happened with Cyril's drowning. Vera begins to admit her involvement in the boy's death but before she finishes they hear a loud noise coming from the house so they go to investigate. They find Bloor dead, having been crushed from a bear-shaped marble clock that sat on the mantel in Vera's room. This fulfills the rhyme's eighth verse, three little Indian boys walking in the zoo. A big bear hugged one and then there were two. Vera and Lombard resolve to wait on the cliffs for rescue, thinking that Armstrong must still be in the house somewhere. Once on the cliffs, they spot something on the beach below and climb down to discover Armstrong's dead body. Suddenly with no one left beside the two, Vera and Lombard see each other as suspects, 
Vera notices Lombard's wolf-like face and sharp teeth. She suggests that they move the body out of the cot and Lombard sneers at her but agrees. Bending over to move the body, Lombard quickly realizes that his gun is missing and spins around to see that Vera has taken it and is pointing at him, he lungs at her but she pulls the trigger and shoots him dead, feeling relieved after having bested the obvious killer, Vera heads back to the house to try and get some sleep before helps arrives. She sees three plates left on the dining room and breaks two, and examines the third while trying to remember the last line of the rhyme, she mistakenly remembers it as, he got married and then there were none. Obviously thinking about Hugo and remembering that he left her for another woman after Cyril's death, she suddenly begins to feel that Hugo is waiting for her upstairs. Climbing the stairs to her room, she drops the revolver on the floor without noticing and walks in on a noose hanging from the hook in her bedroom ceiling that had held the seaweed the night before, exhausted and delusional from the shock, she assumes that Hugo wants her to hang herself and remembers the correct last verse of the rhyme, he went and hanged himself and then there were none. Vera pulls a chair over puts her head through the noose and hangs herself. The book ends with an epilogue in which two police detectives discuss the island case and reconstruct its events, they had investigated and were able to make a timeline of the deaths based on the diaries that several members of the island group were keeping, it is clear to them that Vera was not the murderer since when they arrived to the island, the chair that she had kicked away to hang herself had been neatly set upright against a wall. They reveal that Isaac Morris, the man who hired Lombard and Bloor, bought the island under the false name of Owen and died on an apparent overdose of sleeping pills the night that the guests arrived on the island, the detectives then discuss a manuscript that was found by a fisherman and was given to the police. The manuscript was written by Justice Wargrave, who admits that he knows the solution to an unsolved crime. Wargrave admits that he was a sadistic sociopathic child, who had a lust for killing that he satiated by becoming a judge so that he could sentence people to death, effectively killing within the confines of the law. He states that after many years, his desire to kill became stronger and he wished to deal death personally. One day a doctor told him about a couple that he suspected had killed an old woman by withholding a needed medicine from her and allowing her to die so that they can inherit her fortune, the doctor told Wargrave that the murder couldn't be proven, this conversation made Wargrave think about the number of the murderers that go unpunished because their cases can't be fully solved. He resolved to read up on some of those cases and plan multiple murders to punish these cruel criminals. We learn that Wargrave also killed Isaac Morris, a man who has sold a drug to a young acquaintance of Wargrave's who then killed herself. Wargrave goes on to detail every murder he committed and his reasoning for doing so, taking care to note that he only did it to achieve justice. He also says that he tricked Dr. Armstrong into becoming his ally and that the doctor helped him fake his own death by pretending to find a gunshot wound on the man's forehead. After Lombard and Bloor placed Wargrave back in his room, he sneaked out and met Armstrong on the cliffs. He then pushed the doctor off the cliff killing him. Wargrave says that he could have killed Vera himself, but since he wanted her death to fit the little Indian's rhyme he instead set up the noose in her room and was pleased to find that her own guilt drove her to use it, he further notes that he was the only one not guilty of the crime that he was charged with by the recording on the first day. Since by sentencing Seton to death he was only sentencing a guilty man. In closing, Wargrave admits that he discovered that he was terminally ill some months ago and intended to kill himself after killing the members of the group on the island. He details the lengths he went to stage his own suicide to look like a murder. By setting up the revolver to shoot from a distance with a mechanism of his own making so that he would fall back on his bed as if someone shot him. His last words that the police found are. 10 dead bodies and an unsolved problem on Indian Island. Thanks for watching, like and subscribe for more.